Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Ziegler, director of the Union League Club's Library and Archive. On behalf of the ULCC Library Committee, welcome to our second in series of events on Black entrepreneurship in Chicago, past, present, and future. The ULCC has been a part of Chicago history since its charter in 1879, and we're so pleased to honor Chicago's rich history with programs such as this and through our upcoming ULCC prize for an outstanding book on the history of Chicago to be awarded in March of 2021. Today's program will highlight the life of Jesse Binga, whose story is told by Don Hanger, Hainer, sorry, <laughs> in his book, Binga, The Rise and Fall of Chicago's First Black Banker. We'll open up the conversation to questions from our audience during the last 15 minutes or so of the program so please put your questions anytime during the program into the Q&A and we'll try to address as many of them as possible. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Don Hainer is the retired editor in chief of the Chicago Sun-Times. During his tenure as managing editor and editor, the Sun-Times was awarded multiple national and local awards for investigative reporting and breaking news, including the Pulitzer Prize for Local Reporting in 2011. Don has authored several books on Chicago history and is a graduate of Ripon College and John Marshall Law School. Also with us is Claire Hartfield, a nationally recognized children's book author and education leader. Claire's most recent book, A Few Red Drops, The Chicago Race Riot of 1919, is the winner of the 2019 Coretta Scott King Author Book Award and is a Los Angeles Times Book Award finalist. Claire's book has also been honored as a Junior Library Guild Choice, an Illinois Reading Council top book, and a Chicago Public Library Best of the Best Books 2018. Claire is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Chicago Law School. Her career has centered on providing opportunities for underprivileged children through education. She is currently board chair and senior consultant for one of Chicago's highest achieving charter schools. So I'd like to welcome you both. Um, Don, I believe you'll be giving us a brief overview of the book, right. and then we'll go into conversation between you and Claire. So I'll be turning the program over to you until we go to questions. Okay, uh, thanks Cheryl and, and Claire. And now I'm gonna go to a screen share if I can. And I think, I'm, I think we're good to go. You know, while I was working on uh, Binga, the rise and fall of Chicago's first black banker, anytime I told someone about Jesse Binga, they would invariably say, I've, I've never heard of him. And for me, that was kind of the point. What it is, why has this full story never been told? When uh, Binga's story, I'm just gonna get the, when Binga's story certainly, which, which story certainly involves the bank, it's also broader and more complicated than that. After all, Binga stood out in the 1920s. He was a self-made millionaire, a realtor, an entrepreneur, and Chicago's first black banker. In the early 20th century, he was celebrated as a rags to riches story. He preached the popular all-American gospel of self-help and hard work. He lectured with Booker T. Washington and consulted with W.E.B. Du Bois. He was interviewed by Carl Sandburg, fictionalized by James T. Farrell, and praised by Mother Catherine Drexel who would become America's second Roman Catholic saint. So what happened to his story? I think there are a couple explanations. First, there wasn't a lot of official acts to preserve Chicago's black history in Binga's time. In the first three decades of 20th century Chicago, the city's black population grew from 30,000 to close to a quarter million. Yet it wasn't until 1932 that the city had a library built for and in the so-called black belt. That library, however, also became a place to preserve black history, a little bit after Binga's time. But some early advocates were Binga's contemporaries, including Vivian G. Harsh. Harsh was Chicago's first black librarian and became head librarian of that first black belt library. And interestingly, Vivian Harsh was a young library clerk in 1912 when she was a guest at Jesse Binga's wedding. But Binga's lost story made it May have been more than just a question of not may have been more than just a question of black history being marginalized. 
It was also a question of who he was, what he did, what he said, and what he represented. Bingo was a guy who could push back. He was a tough guy. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, Bingo was a guy who would who wasn't a guy who would kowtow or bend his neck when he spoke to white men or about them. And Bingo himself was a bit elusive, which also complicates the telling of his story. Even though every man, woman, and child in Chicago's black belt came to know his name, Bingo was a puzzle, a bit of an enigma. As the legendary Chicago historian Tamil D. Black Jr. told me, people knew his name, but for the most part, he was a mystery. Gossip and rumors swirled around his marriage to Eudora Johnson, the sister of the city's most powerful policy king. And his public demeanor was largely aloof and unapproachable, even as he greeted customers at his bank. He and his wife rarely entertained more than family at their spacious house at 59th and South Park Avenue, uh, now known as Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, and it still exists there. And apart from visits to the opera, the Art Institute, and perfunctory public appearances, the Bingas mostly kept to themselves. Like many of us, Bingo was different things to different people. He worked hard, made money, a lot of money, and he accomplished the American dream. And then he seemed to be punished for it. In fact, he became a target. When Bingo represented success, while well, Bingo represented success in and around, beyond the black belt, his triumphs also made him one of the most hated men in Chicago, at least in white Chicago. That hate began when Binga dared to break the color line. Whoops, sorry, I'm getting going backwards there. When Binga represented success in the Black Blackwell, his triumphs also, like I said, made him one of the most hated men in Chicago. That hate began when Binga dared to break the color line, which walled off the city's black belt, a small crowded area created through discriminatory practices that used both laws and violence to isolate black Chicagoans in the early 20th century. At the beginning, it was a thin sliver of land that extended down State Street from 22nd Street to 39th Street, and it grew from there. But at the time, it, some parts were as narrow as a half mile. Binga expanded those confining boundaries, and as a consequence, his home and business were attacked by angry whites. The narrative of his life is as telling as it was prophetic. It mirrors the story of Chicago's South Side. It is essentially the story of the origins of segregation in Chicago. Bingo was there at the beginning. When he arrived in Chicago in 1892, blacks were not yet segregated. Blacks and whites sometimes lived on the same street, the same block or in the same building or the same floor. In fact, Italians were more segregated than blacks in the late 1800s. But as the number of African-Americans grew, so did the animosity of whites, fueled by fear and a good amount of hysteria. It makes one wonder, what would the city be like today if housing markets were fairly open to Blacks in the beginning of the 20th century? And this is not to say that Binga's efforts were all pure and righteous. There was certainly uh, an abundance of self-interest in what he did, as with every entrepreneur. And he certainly had his faults. Sure, Binga tried to break the physical and racial boundary lines of the city, but he also cashed in on them. Binga, after all, was an unapologetic capitalist. Still, there was unmistakable, an unmistakable fairness in what he tried to do. Underlining the story, his story is the failure of most American, the most American of promises. If you work hard and make money, you should be able to live wherever you can afford to live. That's the promise of this country. America is supposed to offer the American dream on equal terms for everyone. Bingo's story reveals the hypocrisy of that promise. As a realtor, Bingo was doing what realtors do. You know, and I, I forgot to show you, here's, here's, one of the, here's what Binga's house looked like after one of the bombings. And like I said, his, his house was bombed at least six times. And oddly enough, or, or strangely enough, no one was ever injured on those bombings. But as I was saying, as a realtor, uh, Binga was doing what realtors do, finding homes and apartments for people. But for many white Chicagoans, Binga was doing something he shouldn't. He was moving black customers into white neighborhoods. Even though he never used the wild tactics of panic peddling, he was labeled a blockbuster. But Bingo was merely doing business, meaning supply and demand. Nonetheless, he became a target, as you can see. After Bingo had moved into a white neighborhood, this neighborhood where this house, his house was, he became a bullseye for race haters. His house was bombed six times, including five times in just a six-month period. 
His business was bombed twice, and there were countless other bombings aimed at properties he owned, sold, managed, or leased. Racial tension had been building for most of his years in Chicago, and Binga became a focal point. From July 1917 to March 1921, there were 58 racially motivated bombings in Chicago. That's about one every 23 days. And while most of the bombs left only splintered wood and shattered plastic, some were deadly. Two people were killed, including a six-year-old girl who one night was catapulted out of her grandmother's bed by a fatal blast that slammed her into the ceiling. Through it all, though, no one was targeted more than Jesse Binga. You know, and Binga had critics in the black belt, too. Some said he ran with the wrong crowd because he welcomed gamblers and crime bosses as customers and partners in his bank. And some said he was, he was only about the money because he raised rents and home prices to his customers when he moved them in. <clears throat> in fact, lawyer, alderman, and community activist Earl Dickerson once described Binga as a mean son of a bitch who used all the means he could on people. He said Binga had no interest in racial ideology, and he was interested only in acquiring money and power. And quite frankly, there was some truth to that. But Binga was a race man, and he was also a pathfinder. You see, Jesse Binga became a revered symbol of success, hope, and uplift. He preached economic self-sufficiency, and he lived it. He was a realtor, banker, and millionaire philanthropist, as I pointed out. And he rose early and worked late, he made good money and lived well. He had a nice house complete with an elevator, a modern clothes dryer the size of a small room in his basement, a gym on the second floor, and a limousine and a driver. But he was also charitable. He provided gifts at Christmas for hundreds of school children in the Black Belt. He donated coal to heat the schools. He financed countless college educations for many promising Black students. And he even enjoyed doing small acts of kindness like cooking breakfast for children making their first communion. Bingo was a devout Catholic. In fact, his money was spread beyond what the black belt, beyond the black belt, and sometimes in small private ways. Once when a white grammar school child and neighbor asked him to buy raffle tickets for church, Bingo immediately bought the whole book. A major part of his public and private demeanor is that he would not back down. He was unbowed. This was kind of the focus for him and why he became kind of a hero in the black belt. Throughout the bombings, the threats, and personal attacks, he stood his ground. He would not run. Even in 1919, when he became a lightning rod for the deadliest race riot in Chicago history. The riots began with the drowning of a 17-year-old Black youth named Eugene Williams, who was swimming in Lake Michigan off the so-called Black Beach that ran from 26th to 29th Street. On that hot day in July, some Black men and women had entered the water from the white side and fights broke out with white beachgoers. Williams and several friends were floating on a makeshift raft a few hundred yards from shore when a white man started throwing rocks from breakwater. From breakwater. Williams ducked what was clipped in the forehead and eventually drowned. A white police officer refused to arrest the white man who threw the rock and arrested a black man on shore on another altercation. That, that pretty much lit the, lit the fuse. Fights broke out and those and that turned into riots that lasted for days. Here's a couple pictures of, of the riots. And you can see all these white guys chasing somebody around the black belt or near the black belt. And blacks who had moved into white neighborhoods, their houses were burned. Many houses were burned, as you can see here, and windows broken amid the cheers of these children. And those who moved in, and you can see again, the windows broken many had to move out after the, after the riots. Now this is in front of Jesse Binga's bank and his bank became kind of a clearinghouse for news during the riots. But Binga also set up pay stations because you really couldn't get out of the black belt and you had to get your paycheck somewhere. And Binga set up one at his bank and there were several others set out around. And, and most of the people here were trapped inside the black belt because it was dangerous to leave. When it was over, and by the way, you can just see, barely see Jesse Binga's name right in the center of, of the picture here. And this was his first bank, which was established in 1908. <clears throat> when, when the riots were over, 38 people were killed, hundreds were, were injured, and 1,000 people were left homeless. Much of the damage was in the Black Belt. Imagine just walking outside the Black Belt put you at risk. 
even before and after the riots, anyone from the Black Belt had to be wary of where they were and who was around them when walking into other neighborhoods. When Port Langston Hughes came to Chicago, he crossed Wentworth Avenue into Bridgeport and soon found himself being surrounded and attacked. After the riots, an anonymous letter came from Binga blaming him for the riots and threatening him with the words, you know what comes next. It was signed by a group called the White Hands. Certainly bankers and landlords, and Bingo was both, are sometimes feared or loathed by their customers. But while Bingo wasn't beloved, he was supremely respected, largely because of what I mentioned, his courage. When I began researching Bingo, time and disinterest had already begun to erode the story. I first heard of Bingo as, while well, I was a re working as a reporter for the Sun-Times, and I was, of course, intrigued to read that he, was, he had established the first black bank but I also saw there was much more to his story. The more I learned, the more fascinated I was by his supreme confidence, his guile, and most of his, all of his individualism. As I pulled string on this story, I became captivated. But time was challenging the telling of this story. I just wanna show you, this is Binga's final bank, which he built for about $125,000, which was at 35th in, uh, in state. His other bank was at 36th in state. And Binga also built this, which was the Binga Arcade. And that uh, was right in the corner of the northwest corner of 36th and State. And you know, up, up on the top two floors was a high ceiling ballroom. And on the first floor was an arcade of stores with an aisle down the center. And it became a symbol in, in the Black Belt, a symbol much like Binga was. Since Binga died in 1950, though, there were few people left who could give me firsthand accounts of or about Binga. His only child died a year before I began my research. Unfortunately, I was able to interview a handful of people who knew him, two grandchildren, a relative who once lived in Binga's house for several years, and a man who once worked in a Binga building, the arcade, and heard a Binga speech at an Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity meeting. Bingo was an, uh, not a college graduate, but he was an honorary member of Alpha Phi Alpha. I was also lucky enough to meet a delightful man named Ripley Bingo Mead Jr. Ripley himself was also a successful Southside realtor and a relative of Jesse. He knew Bingo well, and in fact, Ripley's parents both worked at Bingo's bank for nearly two decades, and Ripley became a fount of information for me. I'm a bit embarrassed to say I began researching Binga in ancient times, you know, BI, before the internet. I started old school at a library. As a city, we were fortunate to have the Vivian G. Harris Research Collection at the Woodson Regional Library at 95th and Halsted, obviously named after Vivian G. Harris, the first black librarian. I began there with microfilm and clippings of black newspapers like the Defender, the Broadax, the Whip and the Conservator. Later, the internet would open door, these doors wider to an assortment of archives and newspaper collections across the country. Apart from interviews of the few people still alive who knew Benga, and I did that pretty much in the 90s, I used genealogical records and newspaper files to find any tiny obscure clues or hints about who Jesse Benga was, and that led to more trails of information. For example, in the beginning of my research, I found it difficult to flesh out details about Jesse's childhood. It became a treasure hunt. Slowly pieces came together and through, and first through those newspapers and then through census records. Through newspapers.com, which showed me thousands of articles on Bingo, I once found an intriguing detail in an obscure part of an old 1878 Detroit Free Press story. It was just one paragraph, but it was instructive. Jesse was mentioned being in a quarrel with someone named Barney Schaefer over a velocity that type of big wheeled early bicycle with pedals on the front axle that look impossible to, to manage. The fight happened in front of the Free Press building on a Saturday morning in Detroit. And during the quarrel between these two boys, as the account described them, Schaefer reportedly stabbed Bing in the arm and fled. Jesse was just 13 at the time. And this anecdote provided a small clue into Jesse's character. It suggested that Jesse wasn't the kind of guy who got pushed around or ran from a fight. Slowly through years of research, decades and fast, Binga's story emerged. And you know, I just want to show you one more picture here. This is, these are, this is the arcade and the bank 
shortly before they were torn down in the 1960s. And you can see behind it uh, the Stateway Gardens, which was also has now been torn down as part of urban renewal. One big reason Bingo's life seems seemed forgotten was how it ends. Late in life, uh, the Great Depression came and Bingo's career ended in a tragic tailspin, largely of his own making. Ultimately, he died penniless working as a Paris janitor on the South Side. The pages of Bingo's story is not just a quintessential Chicago story, it's a quintessential American story. It's about how money, success, and politics is continually snagged in race and discrimination in a country that has historically denied equal access to even hope and aspiration. If you read my book on Binga, I hope you find Binga's life as intriguing and I did. And thank you for allowing me to be here today. And now I will stop my share. Great. Really wonderful. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank um, you all for inviting me to be here and to speak with Don about his really terrific book. And if you haven't had a chance to pick it up, it's really a great read. Um, it's interesting to me, I, so I wrote this book about specifically about the 1919 race riot and Bingo was a really big part of that. Um, and I've done, so my book came out in 2018. So I've been going around and doing presentations for, nearly three years now. And one of the main questions or um, responses that I get when I give talks at the beginning is people are just wowed and, and really um, find the, the whole riot so thought provoking to them, especially in times now. Um, but over and over again, no matter what community I'm talking to, uh, the response is I've lived here all my life and I've never heard of this before. Um, and so I think there's kind of a renaissance or an awakening, awakening about this history now. Um, so I think it's very interesting that, you know, within a couple of years, we're seeing books um, about Robert Abbott, who started the Chicago Defender, about the Chicago race riot, about Jesse Binga. And I actually um, write for younger people mostly. And uh, when I was looking for a topic to begin my research on, what impelled me to do that was actually a story that I had learned when I was a child sitting at the knee of my grandmother. Um, because my grandmother had moved to Chicago from the South, like so many Black people in the beginning of the Great Migration, uh, shortly before the 1919 riot. And she actually got caught up in it. Um, and so she told me the story of that and how frightening it was for her. And all these years later, that story came back to me in um, in the context of the chaos and the um, violence that's been going on over the last few years here. And I wanted to know what was going on back then and how was it the same or different from what we're going through now. And so I know that you also grew up in Chicago. Um, and I'm wondering, what is it about the Jesse Binga story that compelled you to look into it and spend so many years researching it and, and, and thinking about that? Don? Well, you know, it, it first started with just Binga the guy. I, I found him to be a fascinating uh, man. And because he was so, like I point out, because he was so tough and uh, fearless in the face of, I think, what would be very daunting for anyone to go through. Uh, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, one time he was moving a, uh, one of his customers had moved into a white neighborhood. And he was surrounded in the front of his house by all these white guys. And Bingo came there, pulled up in his yellow, bright yellow limo, got out, waded through the crowd. And, you know, he's the only black guy besides his customer, wades through the crowd and puts it all to a stop, gets everybody to go to the police station and settles it there. I mean, to me, uh, given the environment that he was surrounded by at that time or the atmosphere of hate, uh, it was pretty tough of him to, to just go in and, and do that. But, you know, the thing that you mentioned, too, you know, 1919 and 1968 and now all kind of seem to be similar to me. Uh, you know, there were questions of race uh, and riots and unrest in all those times period, but particularly 1919 
having its own pandemic, you know, from 1918 to 1921 of the flu, and us having it ours now, and the racial unrest of both those time periods, you, you know, it, it just, you kind of know this keeps repeating itself. It is the unfortunate repetition of American history that we see this over and over again because it's still unsolved or unresolved. And I think the Binga story reflects kind of the age of this problem from the very beginning. And I, like I say, it would have been very interesting to me to have seen Chicago if it had changed at that very beginning in, in some way. And, you know, it's, and it, it's, you know, the question of, uh, redlining, affordable housing, all those kind of questions kind of enter into and get molded in this. But in Binga's situation, it wasn't even about affordable housing. People were being able to afford the housing that they were being put into, even though the prices were often jacked up. And, you know, but it still didn't matter to those neighbors that didn't want them there. And I think all that is, is kind of the, the thing that America keeps facing without apparently full resolution still. Yeah, um, one of the things, I, th I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the interesting things um, for historians about the early 20th century is that that's where segregation in the North really got its firm planting. Um, and, but one of the things that strikes me as different now um, than then is that there's also a real economic um, pulling out of people. So we have not only neighborhoods that are racially segregated, but neighborhoods that are economically segregated. And that was a really different thing um, back in early Chicago when Jesse Bingo was around. Um, and so, yes, there was segregation and there was this small sliver of land that we now know as Bronzeville. And at that time it was called the Black Belt. Um, and into this area, most of the black population in Chicago was housed. And so you had people ranging from, you described Jesse being his home and that he had a chauffeur and all of those things that really evidence his economic success. Um, and at the same time, a block away, there might be a postal worker and a block away from there, there might be someone who works in a restaurant or serves as a maid. Um, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about, you know, we talk about segregation and how it has impeded society and, and there's tremendous truth to that. Um, but there's also this community that was extremely vital at that time. Um, and Jesse Bingo was a really big part of that. And I'm wondering um, if you, for people who don't know the history, if you might talk a little bit about kind of what that neighborhood looked like. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was a mixture of all classes uh, inside the Black Belt by necessity because there was hardly any ways to get out of the Black Belt or to move out of the Black Belt. As I said, uh, well, Jesse Bingo was kind of the, the frontiersman of, of, of that. And uh, so you had, uh, even when Jesse Bingo was living there, he was living on Vernon Avenue and, you know, within a, a half block was a house of prostitution. And, you know, that was the, the, the situation in the Black Belt. You had wealth living next door to poverty and pockmarking through the whole uh, Black Belt. But it was because of when you're confined like that, as, as I think the Black Belt was designed to be by neighboring white Chicago, uh, it, it can't help to, uh, it can't help but kind of destroy the property by overuse, overcrowding, uh, beyond design capabilities, you know, too many people. And, you know, it, it, you, first of all, everybody had to break out, but it was, it was because of what was being put on everyone in the Black Belt that I think changed what the neighborhood would, would be and, and made it into what was considered a ghetto, but it was actually a vibrant uh, mixed class community with a lot of small business, you know, 1500 or so small business when, when Bingo was there, black owned businesses, you know, also white owned businesses there too, particularly on the on State Street, which was the strip for finance or for money and for retail and commercial action. And, uh, 
you know, plus it had music and, you know, it had jazz and it had nightclubs that were hopping and people from all over the city would go there. And the old term, uh, let's go slumming was kind of a, 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 a white term used to go to the black belt to listen to the music and to have fun. And, you know, it was, uh, you could, you could find, uh, I think as, uh, I'm not sure if it was Langston Hughes who said you could find a foot race or a murder in, in the black belt. And uh, another guy said uh, you could put a horn up in the air. A uh, jazz musician said you could put a horn up in the air at midnight and it start playing itself. And that was how the black belt was. It was, it, to me, it sounded exciting and vibrant. And uh, Abbott called it the Mecca of pleasure. I, th I think that's right. And I think that um, because of segregation, um, black people at that time were really forced to create a city within a city. And so right. all of the um, things that would be available to the rest of the city outside of the black belt, there was a sort of a replica or a duplicate of that within the black belt. And because of that, um, these leaders were so well known and they were so accessible. Um, so here's Jesse Binga. He's, for, he's formed the first African-American owned black bank in Chicago. And I know actually um, that my grandparents, when they were here, you know, experienced that and were so proud of the uh, success, um, both in, you know, it was a sign of, um, yes, you, we can, we too can get here. We can have the American dream. Right. Um, and so I think that's something that in some communities now, um, such as Englewood, for example, I think it's harder for people to see. It's not impossible, but I think there that we've lost some of that vibrance. Um, and, uh, and so I think it's important to think, it's sort of, it was the worst of times and the best of times. In, in one sense, it was the worst of times yeah. and that there were too many people living in a small space. It was unsanitary, there was so much disease and all of that, but on the other hand, um, being forced to live together this way um, created a strength within the community. And, and then- Bingo was, Bingo was kind of a yes, we can kind of guy. You know, I mean, he said, yes, we, we're not gonna be denied. And I think that was why he was so looked up to. And even when the bank failed, you know, and it was a psychic blow to the black belt when it failed, but he was always still upbeat and always still we're gonna we're gonna make it and that that was the kind of that was just how he was built. Mm -hmm. I, so when the bank did fail, and I have another sort of personal story here, um, my grandparents had invested all of their money into Jesse being this bank, and they were saving up to buy their own home. And when the bank failed, my grandfather was actually among the people standing in line waiting to get his money out and the door closed. And after that, my, uh, my mother and her siblings remember him saying periodically over and over, because of Jesse Bingo, we will not ever be able to buy the home that we were trying, trying to get. And so that's a personal story, but I think if you look at the communities uh, as a whole, that the Jesse Bingo was a symbol um, and for a long time, he was a symbol of aspiration and of that, yes, we can get far. And then, so the failure also um, was a symbol um, of a, a loss of hope um, that the black community could rise in that way. And I, I'm wondering what, what you thought about that as you researched this. Yeah, and I talked with uh, people who were, uh, had relatives like yours and they were deeply disappointed and saddened obviously by the financial loss. But uh, Dempsey Travis, for example, told me that both his uncle and his dad had money in the bank, but didn't hold it against Bingo when the bank collapsed mm -hmm. it, because Bingo was, was the guy. I mean, that's what uh, Dempsey Travis would always used to say, Bingo was the man. And so it was really, when, when he went down, it was such a psychic blow to the black belt, particularly to the financial idea of the black belt being a thriving successful you know we can we can make it on our own or kind of in the bingo way but in bingo I knew he needed to have white business too I mean he needed he knew you needed to expand beyond just the black belt you can't have a captive economy and 
but when when he went down, uh, it was uh, I, well. Everyone was depressed, of course, during the depression. But I think it was twice as hard in the black belt because uh, the symbols were falling, and the symbols that were looked at for to for hope of the way to get out or the way to change things or the way to 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 become an equal American, uh, if you will. I think that uh, the, the, that was tough on them. And, and Binga had a lot of support even after his failure. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think the other thing that's really interesting about your book is that Binga was also a symbol. He was more than just a man. He was a symbol to the white community, um, a very different kind of symbol. Right. Um, and what happened was he basically pushed back on the unspoken rules, right? Um, and said, we're not going to stay within these boundaries that you have set for us. And for him, it was, as you say, it was a money-making thing. Um, right. He couldn't be as successful as he was without moving out into other communities. Um, but this was the beginning of the creation of structures, um, not just boundaries, but structures to um, enforce segregation. So in neighborhoods like Hyde Park, which was just to the east of the Black Belt, um, the property owners formed associations and used legal um, weapons to start restrictive covenants indeed, so that you couldn't sell to a black person. Um, <clears throat> and people then to the West who were more working class and didn't have the tools um, within the legal system uh, began to use violence. And that, that was sort of the beginning of the tensions that seized and then exploded in 1919. Um, but it sounds to me from your book, like Jesse Bingo was not intimidated by this. And I'm wondering um, what, was, what, what made him tick? What was the zest that kept him going um, in the face of incredible, incredible pushback against him? Well, I, you know, some of it I think came to, from his family uh, when he grew up in Detroit. There, his mom and dad were both entrepreneurs. His dad was a, a barber, which for uh, a black person at that time was a, a good road to a middle class life. And his mom was a realtor. And uh, also she uh, made these special potions for, for cure-alls of, of different kinds that uh, she said were very effective and she was a little bit of an inventor, but it was all about, um, we can do this, you know, we can, we can do all these things. And I think he just, he always had that. I mean, he traveled across the country as a Pullman Porter before he came to Chicago and he made a deal in the, out in the, one of the Western states on an Indian reservation and bought and sold some property there. I mean, he was a deal maker uh, kind of guy. And, you know, and while he was uh, crisscrossing the country, he, he worked as a barber in some places also. And, uh, you know, and, and then went back to being a Pullman Porter. So he was, he was a guy used to trying a lot of different things, but I think he came, I mean, I think he came to Chicago with a, a game plan. And that game plan was to settle his roots here, stop being a guy who had to be moving all across the country all the time. And he started out as a street peddler, which was a tough life, and uh, turned that into becoming a, kind of a street banker. Uh, and then set up his own bank and real estate operation. And you know, he just started out in real estate by running out uh, space in his room, his rented room which I, a lot of people did, but I mean, he did it, I think in an extraordinary way, he kept growing it. And so it, it was that uh, can-do attitude that he had that I think really make him, made him break through and become as successful as he was. Yeah, so he was actually a, a, one of the old models of a serial entrepreneur. Um, and, and you know, the odd thing too is, you know, when you talk about how he was viewed by whites, I mean, yeah, he was he was pretty much hated by a lot of the whites in the surrounding neighborhoods. But when he first moved into his house, he had no problems there. And he would wave and the neighbors would wave back. And he was a front page story in the Tribune, uh, the Sunday Tribune, which was a big place to be uh, for a white guy, let alone a black guy. And uh, it was a, he was celebrated as a success story, a rags to riches success story in the Tribune. So, I mean, he he. He had kind of a dual representation in white Chicago to some degree. I mean, he was hated on the South Side, and maybe by others 
in the city for what he was doing in terms of housing, but he was certainly uh, praised and, and uh, feted for, for being a guy who uh, could make it on his own. Yeah, he was a real Chicago character, I think. Yeah, yeah. They were like that in the past and they're still like that now, I think. <laughs> Um, so we only have a little bit more time before we take questions. Um, but one of the reasons, as I said, that I wrote this book about 1919 was because there were so many echoes of what's going on today. And I wonder what, how you see that um, in terms of what was the impact that Jesse Binga had that we can still see the effects of now? And it looks like you might be frozen here. I don't know if we're gonna be able to unfreeze you. Okay, this Aaron, is- Do you know? This is, this is when we punt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, he's gonna, he's probably gonna-, gonna log back in. Come yeah. back in. Um, you, might, you might know this answer to a question. Um, do you- do you know if Binga's home on South Park still exists? Ooh, I don't. I don't know if it does or not. Okay. Up at Don does. So one. I know that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the homes uh, from back then actually do still exist. So I wouldn't be surprised if it does. If you drive down um, the street there, there are many, many, many really old homes, some of which have been restored and some of which are not in really good condition. Um, and they're talking about putting better, speaking of you know, his, this history becoming um, told now in a way that it hasn't been for, for a century. Um, I heard that there's a, a plan to put more visible landmarks around Brownsville um, to commemorate uh, people like Jesse Binga so that right. when people go through there, they know the questions to ask. One project that I worked on, this is sort of the same kind of thing. I worked on the project to get uh, the street sign downtown changed to be Ida B. Wells Parkway. And it was a really important thing to me um, because it is a symbol of our diverse history as a city. And um, for so many years, I know when I was a kid, um, most of who we heard about were, did not include um, the diversity of leaders that we've had in this city. Um, and now it's so satisfying to me every time I go down, well, I haven't done it lately because of the pandemic, but when I would go downtown on the number six Jeffrey Express bus to hear that voice next stop Ida B. Wells Parkway is just a wonderful thing because you imagine a six year old kid sitting on the bus saying who was Ida B. Wells and it engenders a conversation which um, allows the next generation to have a much fuller and richer understanding of our city's history. Um, and so I, I hope that Binga's house is still there and can get a plaque to be commemorated. Right. La last week we had um, Robert Weems uh, do a program talking about Anthony Overton, mm -hmm. um, which was, was fascinating as well because he was within that same time frame as Jesse Binga. Um, and one of the things that, that, you know, kind of struck me while Don was talking was that the, the past life of Jesse Binga and Anthony Overton is kind of murky. It's, it's kind of, um, there he is. there's Don. <laughs> and, you know, Sorry. from what I, that's okay. We're we're having a little conversation. <laughs> okay, lost in the ether, I guess. <laughs> well, th this was a question that I was asking um, last week. We had um, Robert Weems on talking about Anthony Overton, and um, so it, one of the things that that um, Dr. Weems talked about was how Overton's past history was really pretty murky. And you were you had mentioned that Binga's past life was was a little bit murky, um, and do you think that that was on purpose to 
um, you know, did or is or was it just a function of the records have not been kept well? Yeah, I think it's a combination of, 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 of a few of those ingredients. And I, I do think that uh, <clears throat> I don't think till really in more recent history, black history has been appreciated for what it is, particularly in Chicago mm -hmm. and for what Chicago represented in terms of black history nationwide. Uh, kind of, I mean, I know Tulsa has been often mentioned as the capital of black capitalism, but I mean, Chicago to me is, is, is one of the, uh, the highlights of capitalism for, for blacks uh, in America. And, uh, but I also think, you know, in, so nobody was preserving some of that information. There's no papers left of Bingas. There's, you know, at the very beginning, I only found one letter. You know, now I've got, you know, quite a few more, a couple dozen maybe. But, you know, thanks to the internet opening up and I, I got correspondence with Du Bois that was uh, preserved through the Du Bois, you know, you know records. But uh, I, I think now we are paying more attention. We're finding more things. And even at 95th in, uh, in Halstead, uh, there's an encouragement to bring family papers there to see mm -hmm. what might be discovered. And I'll give you a tiny little example in Binga's world. Binga was very impressed with himself. And he wrote a book of uh, little sayings that he published called The Certain Sayings of Jesse Binga. And I have not been able to find one copy of it. And I'm sure somewhere in somebody's attic on the south side of Chicago, there's probably one of these. I'd love to see somebody bring it to the uh, Vivian Harsh collection and, and put it there. Right. We, we have a couple. The thing I liked about your book was um, how you talked about how Jesse put the big B on everything. Um, and I thought he was a terrific marketer, even at the very beginning, because um, I know part of it was just he, he was in love with his name. Uh, but I don't think I'll ever see the letter B in that kind of scrolly way without thinking about Jesse Binga now. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. And he, he did put, he was a great, and somebody once said, he almost sounds a little like Trump. And I go, well, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> maybe not, but maybe as a marketing, but, you know, but not, not in other ways. So we have a couple of other questions. Um, uh, Bob Joint wanted to know if Binga's home on South Park still exists. It does, and it's been rehabbed, and uh, private persons live in there, and it, it looks good. Okay, and he also wanted to know, were real estate losses the primary reason for the failure of the Binga State Bank? Yes, I, I believe so, and, and he, uh, he had some, he, he gave out a, a, quite a few mortgages that weren't always protected by the value of the property, uh, at least at the end because of the depression. And uh, Oscar de Priest, who was congressman and alderman in Chicago, became the trustee uh, in bankruptcy to take care of the property. And he had quite a few arguments with Oscar de Priest about the value of that property. But obviously, Jesse Bingo, being a forward looking guy, couldn't look back and see what had just happened to everybody, I think, in, in terms of property value. And so all his property value was, you know, obviously sank well below, in some cases, uh, the mortgages that he was giving out. It was like their own little housing bubble at first. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, um, the depression must have had a huge impact on all of this, I'm assuming. Oh, oh yeah, and you know, it was, it everybody. yeah, I, I point out in the book too, like uh, unemployment was, you know, like twice what it was uh, for whites. And, you know, and as, as we know, uh, you know, blacks are often the uh, uh, last hired and the first fired, and, 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 and that was very true in the Depression era. Um, a question from George Vrejcek. Um, You felt that Binga's mother was likely white. Did you find any additional info on that? You know, Binga's mom's uh, background is also pretty strange. You know, she claimed to have been raised by, uh, by Indians. And and learn and to you know American Native Americans and learned how to uh, these medicinal cures while growing up like that. And then she also claimed that she was from a very wealthy white family that would have shocked everyone if we would have known what white families they were. But she never said. And uh, she listed herself in census as uh, 
interchangeably, sometimes as white, sometimes as mulatto, and sometimes as black. So it's uh, like a lot of things in, in Binga's deep background, it's, there's still a little, some questions out there, or as uh, Timmy Black said, he, it was a mystery to many. Right. Um, Don Gones asks, was the bank 100% owned by Binga or did he have other investors? Do you know how he secured a bank charter and how much capital he started with? You know, I'd have to look up the capital because the numbers might not be as quick to my mind, but he did have other investors. At the beginning, it was his. And I think that caused him to think it was, was always his. And so he made decisions probably in an imperious way because he always, you know, like entrepreneurs do, they build something up and then other people get invested in it. They still think it's theirs. And I think Binga felt that way. But eventually he had uh, other investors like uh, Abbott, uh, some doctors. Uh, he was going to have uh, a new bank that he was going to have a policy king and political uh, guy, Dan Jackson, was going to be involved in. Dan Jackson's brother, funeral director and probably involved in policy too, uh, was a vice president at the bank. Uh, and I think he was an investor. I mean, he did at the end, and his wife was a big investor too. His wife had money and was a, a pretty smart speculator in her own right in real estate and had inherited some real estate from her policy king brother. So Binga and his wife were, the, by, by, by and large, the biggest investors in the bank, but he did have other investors. And, and you know, uh, some of them were hurt, obviously, when it went down and and uh, the one doctor had to start all, basically start all over again and close the hospital he had. So there were, there was, uh, there was bad ramifications. Well, banks were um, pretty regulated back then, right? And so- Well, was, when, when it was a private bank, he was very much unregulated. When he became a state bank, he had to uh, show his records and you know, be certified. And so it was a different thing. So he was following the law on that. And he did that, I think it was 19, early 1920s when he became a state bank. Um, we have one other question from George Raychak. Um, he says, interesting that James T. Farrell wrote about the neighborhoods from his perspective in his Lonigan and O'Neill books. Did you have a chance to read the applicable Farrell books or short stories, um, e.g. Fastest Boy on 57th Street? Well, you know, the, the uh, I did I did that, and I also have included a little bit in the uh, you know from Studs Lonigan, because <clears throat> Farrell fictionalized Jesse Binga as Abraham Clarkson, and uh, and talks about him being bombed, his house being bombed. So it was an interesting perspective to see it, and uh, he suggested that Binga Binga bought his house from a guy who probably who was a, a bartender. A, saloon owner, Irish saloon owner, that he said probably was doing it to get even with the neighborhood because they were looked down on a, a barkeeper. But ultimately, I think it was more complicated than that. And uh, I think Binga might have used one of his employees who was very light skinned to buy the property uh, and because she could pass for white and then turn it, they, she sold it back to them then. Um, Neil McCrillis actually shared um, a link to, there's a, there was a story in Chicago Magazine on um, the renovation of Binga's home. Uh, I'm not smart enough to be able to share this with, <laughs> with the audience. So um, just, you know, just look for Chicago Magazine uh, when you like Google and uh, Binga Home Rehab. So there's that. Um, yeah, you know, I'll point out when I was, at one point I went to Binga's house a couple times before it was rehab and it was just a shell and the garage was gone. You know, and I walked around it and, and I asked a couple neighbors if they knew anything about it and they said no, but they heard they heard that somebody famous there, maybe El Capone lived there or something. You know, I mean, that was, there, there were a lot of various ideas of what was going on there, but it was great to see that the house was saved. Um, I had one final question. Um, in your research on this book, did you did you come across any kind of um, like relationship between Binga and Anthony Overton? I mean, they were both you know of that high powered um, entrepreneur type within that time. Um, yeah, you know, I, I did, and you know, Binga 
when his bank was going down, he went to Overton to, and I learned some from uh, Dr. Weems' book too, a little more. Uh, but when his bank was going down, he went to Overton to see as a last ditch effort to try to uh, get some money to help him. Now, Overton was going to have his own problems, although his bank lasted a little longer than Binga's before it folded. But uh, Overton offered him some terms, but Binga didn't like it, didn't like the terms. And that was kind of so, so Binga, you know, and so as a consequence, he didn't make the deal and the bank went down. Well, I want to thank you both so much for being here and um, talking about both of your books and um, your experiences in researching this period of time in Chicago history. Um, I, I think it's so important that, that we start looking at some of these forgotten narratives. And I wanna thank you both for, for being here to, to give your expertise on this. Well, thank you. And thank you, Claire, too, for taking the time to, to do the discussion. It's really fun. It's really fun to um, be able to talk to other people who know a lot. Some of the, some of the, story, the backstories that I did not uncover in research are just fascinating and fun to know. So well, thank, was, thank, was, you thank, me. Oh, thank you too. Yeah. Ho hopefully we can all get together and be history geeks together and raise a glass to raise a glass in to be person. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye, -bye. Bye now.